And can you, if you are attached to something or some idea, some person, can you end it to now? Mm. That is death. Which means, can you live with death all the day long? Oh, think of it, go into it. You will see the greatness of it, the immensity of it. That is, not commit suicide, we are not talking that silly stuff. But to live with that. Ending all sense of attachment, all sense of fear, which means having a brain that is active but never active in active and not have direction, purpose, all the rest of it. Active. That is to live with death every second, never collecting, never gathering, never giving anything a continuity. Sirs, you don't know. If you do it, you will see what it means. That is real freedom. Now let's do some new thinking. What about death? Is death sickness? Or is it a healthy natural event like being born? Of course it is. So, I mean, a little change in social attitude about this will fortify everybody else. I mean, I'm, if I'm alone and all my relatives are going, mmm, kind of <laughs> pretending to me it's going to be hard for me. I've got to challenge the whole bunch of them and get my dander up and say, listen, damn you, I don't want all this thing around here. You've got to take a different attitude about my death. Well, that's hard. But if everybody helps me, and we do, we are all one body. If they all come around and say, congratulations, you're going to die. <laughs> Liberation. Liberation now, you see. Because just before you die, I mean, look, I know very well a skillful priest handling a person dying can do this for them. But he has to talk very, very, very straight. And he has to say, listen, these doctors, uh, you don't, don't you pay any attention to them. They're trying to amuse you and deceive you. You're going to die. This isn't terrible. But it's just going to be the end of you as a system of memories. And so you've got a great chance right now before it happens to let go of everything. Because you know it's going to go and it's going to help you. It's going to help you let go of everything. So if you have any possessions left, give them away. Give everything away. And uh, if you have anything to say that is, you felt that you ought to say before you die and that you're kind of hanging on to and it's bothering you, say it. In other words, that man dies happy if there is no one to die. In other words, if the ego has disappeared before death caught up with it. We must understand mortality is the fundamental reality of our existence. If you do not come to terms with this one thing, believe me, you don't know any other aspect of life in reality. You know only the drama. Because this is the most fundamental nature of our existence that we are mortal. When we are born, it is declared that we are going to die, isn't it? How long is only question. Death is something that's common to all of us. So, in talking over together about this subject, which is of extraordinary significance, death is not a sensation. You understand? It's not something we'd have cried over. 
something to be remembered, avoided, something that you put on the mantelpiece and worship. It is an immense act. So we're going to talk over together that. Man has always been frightened of death. That's a fact. Why? What does death mean? Not what lies beyond death. We'll go into that presently. What is this immense? It is something extraordinary to die, not something to be avoided. You, you can't avoid it. One may die when one is very young, through some disease, through some accident, through their parents' fault, over drinking, smoking, you know, the whole business of this ugly society. And there is death to, for old age, through accident, disease, senility, and so on. So together we are going to inquire into it. Together. Please bear this in mind all the time. We are going to give your energy to find out the significance, the depth of that extraordinary event. There are two things implied in it. Basic. A continuity and the ending of a continuity. You understand? We have lived 40, 50, 90, 120, whatever the length of time it be. And during that long interval from birth to death, we have acquired so many things. Not only physical things, cars, houses, if you're lucky. A field about half an acre, and you have acquired knowledge, experience. You have collected lots of memories. Right? Lots of experience. You have certain, you have collected, gathered, both outwardly and psychologically. You don't want to be deprived of what you have collected, what you have remembered, what you have suffered. So we want and we have a long continuity, racial inheritance, collective limited experiences. We, have, we are gathering monk, squirrels, right? And to what we have gathered, we are attached tremendously. And that is a continuity. It may be a ten-day continuity. Or hundred years continuity, the continuity of tradition, the continuity of identification with a race, with a group, with a family. You understand? This desire, this urge to continue, not only in myself, but the inherited collection. I want, if I die, there is my son to continue. He inherits what I have collected physically and also psychologically. 
So there is this long centuries and centuries upon centuries of collecting and continuing, right? Death comes along, which is the organism withers, either we have used it sanely, rationally, healthily, or misused it through various drugs, you know, that's happened. So, the organism inevitably comes to an end. The ending is death, right? So we must consider what does it mean to end? You understand? The continuity and the ending. We are together. We are talking over together. This is a conversation between you and the speaker. So there is this continuity which you cling to, and there is the ending of that continuity. So we must we have understood, I hope, what it means to continue. And so we said, let me I will die, but next there is something I will live next life, right? There will be next life. That's the whole Asiatic, Pythagorean, and some Western people, ancient people said there must be. And the whole of the East more or less believes in rebirth because they want to continue. They are never asked, some, some have asked, the ancient people, what is it that continues? <coughs> is there a continuity at all? Are you asking all this? No, you are not, I am asking you. God save me. Is there a continuity at all? And if there is no continuity, what is it all about? Why should I collect any more? So I won't collect it. Then they become hermits, sanya, the Indian sanya, monks, and you know all that. I won't collect it more. Only I've collected one idea, which is my God my saviour, my guru, you follow? One, collect, one thing I have collected, I just cling to that. So, we know what it means to have a continuity. So we have to inquire into what does it mean to end. End, voluntarily, not through age or disease and some kind of awful pain and anger, all that. What does it mean to end anything? Right? Therefore, one asks, is continuity creation or invention? You following all this? Are you calm? I would like to. Can continuity be ever creative? Or where there is continuity as knowledge, there is invention. Right? That is, invention is based on knowledge. Right? Scientific invention, mechanical inventions, and so on, because there is previous knowledge. Which is following the same line of, of invention, gathering more knowledge, inventing more. That's what's happening technologically in the world. So, is creation, creation not just the baby, 
creation. Is it related to ending? You understand? So we're going to find out. Oh, you people. Please, I'm talking, you're not joining in this. Don't get too tired, please. So what is ending? Can I end? Please listen. Habit. Can I end a habit tomorrow or today? Inquire into it. Voluntarily, not through desire, through direction, because somebody says end it, then you'll have get a reward and all that child, immature stuff. But find find out for ourselves what it means to end something easily, happily, without any effort. That means ending not only certain physical habits, but the habits that the brain has cultivated to live safely, you understand? End it. That's what means to die, doesn't it? Because we are vast accumulation of memories. We are a bundle of memories. Right? I want to see this. Not, I am spiritual and God and all that stuff. There's still memory. The Indians have their own explanation. Separate Atman. I won't go into all that. So, death means the ending. Right? You may not accept it, you may not like it, but that's a fact. You can't take everything with you. You might like to keep it until the last moment. (laughs) If you have a bank account (laughs) and have everything comfortable, you might like it till the last second. We used to know a man who had collected a lot of money immensely rich and he was dying and he kept a lot of it in his cupboard literally I happened to be there he told his son to open the cupboard to look at all the diamonds gold and bank account notes and he was looking at it happily and he was dying <laughs> I know. (laughs) And he never realised he was dying, because the money mattered enormously. Not death, but that which is contained in that cupboard. So, is there an ending? Once deep memories, to one's attachment. Ah, let's take that up. Is there an ending to your attachment? What is attachment? Why are we attached to something or other? property, money, to wife, to husband, to some foolish conclusion, to some ideological concept. Why are we so attached?
and quiet. Let's talk it over together. And the consequences of attachment. If I'm attached to you, if the speaker is attached to you as an audience, think what is the, what is the state of m- my brain must be. He's frightened he may not have an audience. He's, he becomes nervous, almost apoplectic. <laughs> and he was attached to exploit people, to have a reputation. You understand? So, the consequences of attachment if you observe it very closely, whether it be a wife, husband, a boy or a girl, or an idea, or a picture, or to a memory, to an experience, what the consequences are that you beat fear of losing, right? And of that fear, there is jealousy. You follow me? How jealous we are of those in power who are, you follow? All the jealousy. From jealousy there is hatred. Right? Of course, jealousy is hatred. And when you are attached, there is always this suspicion, secrecy. Haven't you noticed all this? I don't have to tell you. It's so common in the world. And can you, if you are attached to something or some idea, some person, can you end it to now? Mm. That is death. Which means, can you live with death all the day long? Oh, think of it, go into it. You will see the greatness of it, the immensity of it. That is, not commit suicide, we are not talking that silly stuff. But to live with that, Ending all sense of attachment, all sense of fear, which means having a brain that is active but never active in active and not have direction, purpose, all the rest of it. Active. That is to live with death every second, never collecting, never gathering, never giving anything a continuity. Sirs, you don't know. If you do it, you will see what it means. That is real freedom. And from that freedom there is love. Love is not attachment. Love is not pleasure, desire, fulfilment. Now, there really isn't anything radically wrong with being sick or with dying. Who said you're supposed to survive? Who gave you the idea that it's a gas to go on and on and on? (laughs) And we can't say that it's a good thing for everything to go on living from the very simple demonstration 
that if we enable everybody to go on living, we overcrowd ourselves. That we're like an unpruned tree. And so, therefore, uh, one person who dies, in a way, is honorable because he's making room for others. And the panic that all life everywhere must be saved, although each one of us individually will naturally appreciate it when anybody saves our life, if we apply that case, you see, all around, we can see that it's not workable. We can also look further into it and see that if our death could be indefinitely postponed, we would not actually go on postponing it indefinitely. Because after a certain point, we would realize that that isn't the way in which we wanted to survive. Why else would we have children? Because children arrange for us to survive in another way. By, as it were, passing on a torch so that you don't have to carry it all the time there comes a point where you can give it up and say, now you work. It's a far more amusing arrangement for nature to continue the process of life through different individuals than it is always with the same individual. Because as each new individual approaches life, life is renewed. And one remembers how fascinating the most ordinary everyday things are to a child because they see them all as marvelous because they see them all in a way that is not related to survival and profit. And when we get to thinking of everything in terms of survival and profit value, as we do, then the shapes of scratches on the floor cease to have magic. And most things, in fact, cease to have magic. So therefore, in the course of nature, once we have ceased to see magic in the world anymore, we are no longer fulfilling nature's game of being aware of itself. There's no point in it anymore. And so we die. And so something else comes to birth, which gets an entirely new view. And so nature's self-awareness is a game worth the candle. It is not, therefore, natural for us to wish to prolong life indefinitely. But we live in a culture where it has been rubbed into us in every conceivable way that to die is a terrible thing. And that is a tremendous disease from which our culture in particular suffers. And we notice it firstly in the way in which death is swept under the carpet. This is one of the major problems in hospital work. When a family conspires with the doctor to keep from grandmother the knowledge that she is dying. Grandmother suspects that she is dying but probably doesn't really want to know for sure. And her family talk with her in such a way as to say, well, it'll be, you, you, you'll probably be getting all right in a few weeks. And won't it be nice to be able to do this, that, and the other, uh, because they have this funny feeling that it's important to build up courage and hope. And so they become liars and a mutual mistrust develops uh, because once you are playing the game on that level, you tend to play the mistrust on other levels. And so the person is left to die alone, 
suddenly unprepared and doped up to the point where death hardly happens. And there is no derivation from it of the peculiar spiritual experience that can come with death. Back in 1958, I was in Zurich and there met a most extraordinary man by the name of Karl Fried von Dürkheim. He was a former German diplomat who had studied Zen in Japan. And when he came back after the war, he opened a meditation school and retreat in the Black Forest. And he said, well, I tell you what, a lot of my work has to do with people who went through spiritual crises during the war. And he said, you know, uh, we, we, we all know that when a person's in an absolutely extreme situation and they accept it, there is a possibility of a natural satori. And that's what I mean when I was explaining that when one gets to an extreme, that is to say, to the point where you realize that there is nothing you can do about life, nothing you cannot do about life, then you're the mosquito biting the iron bull. Well, so in the same way, he said, look, you heard a bomb coming at you. You could hear it whistle and you knew it was right above you and headed straight at you and that you were finished. And you accepted it. And suddenly, there was a strange feeling that everything is absolutely clear. You suddenly see that there isn't a grain of dust in the whole universe that's in the wrong place. That you understand completely, absolutely, totally, what it's all about. Because you can't say what it is. But he said, in so many cases, the bomb was a dud, and they lived to tell the tale. Or he said, you were in a concentration camp. You've been there so long that you gave up all hope whatsoever, ever getting out. You were just going through this miserable, boring, degrading grind, week after week after week. Nobody paid the slightest attention to you as an individual. You knew you would never get out, and you accepted it. And suddenly, something changed. Six extraordinary feeling of freedom. Or he said, you were a displaced refugee. You had lost your family. You didn't know whether they even existed. You were miles from your home. You didn't know whether it existed. You had lost your job, your very identity. You were absolutely nowhere. And you accepted it. And suddenly, you were as light as a feather and free as the air. Now, he said, so many people have had those experiences and they talk about them to their families and friends and they say, oh, well, you were under terrific pressure and you probably had some hallucination, you know? Well, he said, I am showing those people that so far from having a hallucination, those were the few, few occasions in which they woke up. So, you see, this is always the opportunity presented by death. That if one can go into death with eyes open and have somebody help you, if necessary, to give up before you die, this extraordinary thing can happen to you. So that from your standpoint, in that position, at that time, you would say, I wouldn't have missed that opportunity for the world. Now I understand why we die. The reason we die is to give us the opportunity to understand what life's all about. By letting go. Because then we come to a situation that the ego can't deal with. When we are no longer hypnotized by that, then our natural consciousness can see clearly what all this universe is for. 
So, therefore, we have missed this golden opportunity by institutionalizing death out of the way instead of having a socially understood acceptance of death and rejoicing in death. Now, I could imagine that uh, one person would want to rejoice in death in an entirely different way from another. Like, um, say, a wedding is a rite of passage. Uh, there are certainly some forms of celebrating a wedding which I would find a total bore and quite offensive. Other ways would be very good. I would enjoy it. So everybody, in other words, I'm not saying that you've got to get mixed up with a lot of people coming, laughing around you and giving you presents and cards and everything because you're going to die. <laughs> but I'm only indicating a general thing, that the doctor, the, the, the ministers, the psychiatrists, and above all, us, really owe it to our friends to work out an entirely new approach to death. Because what has happened, you see, from earliest childhood, the child learned that great uncle was dying and saw the family put on long faces and say, oh, that's too bad. Even Christians who think they're going to go to heaven, you know, they get absolutely morbid, more so than anybody else about death, because heaven, as they all know, is a very boring place. <laughs> and so this frightful thing, oh, he's dead. No one understands that for the living to lose someone you love or even for a dying person to worry about what on earth my wife, my children, my whatever are going to do without me. One can understand a certain worry in that. But nobody is indispensable. And there comes a point when you have to say, I'm sorry, but I am completely going to abandon responsibility for anything. Because there is no further way I can do it. This is another way of that surrender. And then the curious thing that occurs is the moment all that has dropped, suddenly it dawns on you. that to be important, existence does not have to go on any longer than a moment. Quantitative continuity is of no value. How long can you hold your breath? Who cares? <laughs> so, it follows from that, you see, that if any one of us, without being shocked into it by being bombed or put in a concentration camp, could at this moment be as one about to die, genuinely and honestly, we would understand the mystery of life. Because death is the, is it in a certain sense, the source of life. Just as we see in nature, when the leaves fall from the trees, they mold and rot, and this supplies humus from which more plants can grow. It's a cycle like that. But in every way, symbolic and otherwise, human beings try to stop that cycle. Unamuno said, human beings are the only species that hoard their dead. And therefore, with the ghastly art of the mortician, we try to make the body unpalatable to the worms, and so to stop life, as if to be eaten in due course were an indignity to the human being, whereas we eat everything else and we give nothing back. So that is a kind of a social symptom of our profound disorientation with respect to death. We think death is unnatural, and furthermore, in our culture, we think birth is a disease. 
and send a mama to the hospital for the most unnatural, weird kind of parturition. In other words, more and more one regards the healthy and inevitable and natural transformations of the body as pathological. I can imagine, you know, people having sexual intercourse on an operating table to be sure that the whole thing is hygienic. <laughs> you know, uh, the, uh, everything about us like that is, is, is become over interfered with by specialists and less and less the province of our own preferences. It's very, very hard indeed to die in your own way without some blasted bunch of relatives come fussing around and insisting that you go to a hospital, that you get fixed with the tortures of being fed through tubes and things to keep you alive indefinitely and waste the family savings. It's even a crime to commit suicide. Now, this is simply nonsense. It's this perfect panic to survive at all costs. In our lives, whether we are going to get educated or not, we don't know when we are born. Whether we are going to get married or not, we do not know. Whether we are going to bear children or not, we do not know. Whether we are going to do this, that and so many things in the world or not, we do not know. But we know one thing that we are going to die. Yes or no? Yes. That's one certainty, isn't it? Yes. Though it is such an obvious thing, we are not able to come to terms with it. <clears throat> Somebody was asking me, Sadhguru, how do snakes die? Where do they die? Because we don't see ever a dead snake unless it's killed by somebody. They're asking this question in a tropical country, and I think it's relevant in California also, where there are actually millions of snakes. But they are quiet lives, they don't show themselves too often unless you step into their terrain somewhere. They don't show themselves, they're just there. <laughs> so where do they die? This is something very wonderful, particularly cobras. When they want to die, when they know they should die, they will withdraw, find one perch somewhere and go sit there and they won't eat. For over eighteen to twenty days, they will not eat anything and sit in the same place and they'll die there. At one time, out of misplaced compassion, <laughs> I brought down these cobras because I knew where they would be sitting. I would pick them up, bring them and try to force feed them, try to put some food into them and do something about it. But do what you want, they won't accept a little bit of food. If you leave them, again they go and sit in the same place and they will die there quietly. I'm saying a crawling creature has that much awareness, knows how long this body should be on and when it should go. Similarly, your life and every other life has this consciousness as to when it should exist, exit this body, either because we broke the body in some way or because simply the necessary intensity in the body doesn't exist anymore to sustain life. So we must understand, when I say, when I use certain words, do not understand it in normal sense. When I say a, a life decides when to leave, it's not like you think about it and you decide, not that kind of decision. In, in its own way, not with thought, Many decisions about who you are is not decided by your thought, it's simply made, isn't it? Like that, a life decides when to leave. As long as it's here, we will do everything to preserve it and to hold it and keep it with us because we cherish and value that life. But once it leaves, we must respect that because that life has chosen to leave. Now when I say life, I'm not talking about the person. 
I am not talking about the personality, I am not talking about variety of thoughts and emotions and activities that person was involved in. You as a person never want to leave because you want to be an endless psychological drama. But life wants to leave at a certain time. Whether you like it, you don't like it, life wants to leave because it doesn't want to be trapped in the physical form that you have gathered forever. It doesn't want. It enjoys the physical form only to a certain length of time. After that, even if everything is well, many lives leave. You will see this particularly in India. Yogis will decide when to leave. When they're very healthy and well, they sit down and they leave. Other people think, why he was healthy, why should he leave? So you want to get sick and die? Do you want to suffer in the hospital for three years and then only leave? Is that the only way to go? No. Please listen to this carefully because this is a situation. I… I'm not trying to trample on anything, but I want you to listen to this carefully. Is it true that the final thing that you do in your life is death? Hello? So the last thing that you do in your life, is it not very important that you do it gracefully? Yes. Huh? Yes. You're… you're all from Los Angeles, you must do it in style, isn't it? <laughs> At least gracefully. Is it also not important that other lives who are around us, when their time comes, we must facilitate that they must be able to leave gracefully? not make them a victim of medical industry that's going on around us? Hello? Yes, yes. Tell me, if what purpose does it serve if you stretch a life which is about to exit now for another three months with all kinds of supports, three months you stretched it in pain and misery, what does it mean? It just means that you're ignorant about the nature of life and you want to cling to something that you know, and you don't want to know anything that you do not know. It's very important. We know the person, we know this person and this person and this person, that's fine. We've enjoyed their personalities, but you have not touched the nature of their life. Because unless you touch the nature of your life, you cannot touch the nature of another life. So the most important thing we need to do is, we don't have to talk about death, prepare for death, nothing is needed. What we need to do is, beyond this body, which we have gathered, which you agreed to… agreed with me that you accumulated this, beyond this mind, which is also an accumulation of impressions and I I information, beyond your accumulations, if you sit here right now and experience the life that you are, you will have absolutely no issue with any aspect of life, which includes death. Death is not another thing. Death… death is an ongoing thing right now. All of us are dying slowly. One day it'll be complete. You think it's going to suddenly happen one day? It is already on, isn't it? Hello? Yes. Is it not on? Yes. It is on in every one of us. Should we not conduct this process? See, you can call this… call this right now, I can say I'm living. Another way of say, saying it is I'm dying. I'm dying right now. We want to stretch it as much as we can, but to know this experientially, not trying to figure this intellectually is most important because intellectually if you figure, you will always be one against the other because this is the nature of intellect, that intellect cannot perceive anything without creating two. So you have created life and death, there's no such thing as life and death. Life and death is one package, isn't it? Hello? Yes. It's one package. As we are living, as we are also dying right now. The question is how gracefully you do it. If you learn to do this moment absolutely gracefully, you will also conduct that moment absolutely gracefully. That is not a different kind of moment, that's the same moment. In the yogic science, it goes like this. Every inhalation you are born, every exhalation you die. When you were born as a little infant, the first thing that you did was inhalation, isn't it? <gasps> what do you think is the last thing you will do? 
exhalation, isn't it? Right now when you sit here, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation, next inhalation did not happen and suddenly a big man is gone, poof, yes or no? That's how fragile it is, I want you to see this, every moment it's happening. If this exhalation which went out, if it doesn't come back, this one is gone. How many things a man can do? But at the same time, just see how fragile this is. This is… you are yo-yoing with your life every moment. If you don't know how to pull it back, it will go away. But it doesn't feel like that right now, I am real. I'm not going to die today. A whole lot of people thought so before you and me. We must understand mortality is the fundamental reality of our existence. If you do not come to terms with this one thing, believe me, you don't know any other aspect of life in reality. You know only the drama because this is the most fundamental nature of our existence that we are mortal. When we are born, it is declared that we are going to die, isn't it? How long is only question. I bless you with a very long life. Thank you very much for being here.